Okay, today's guest is a lifelong tennis player and comes to the podcast with a wealth of experience from all sides of our sport. After a successful junior career and college career, he became an accomplished D1 coach at the University of Pacific for several several years and also helped bring pro events to Stockton, California. Currently, he's the CEO of Youth Tennis San Diego and general manager of the Barnes Tennis Center, which many of us all know and love, and is going to talk to us a bit about the new USTA SoCal Pro Circuit. Welcome to Talk Tennis, Ryan Redondo. All right. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining. I have to do like a bit of an icebreaker. Um, It's been a minute, but... Do you remember me from Wild? I do, I do. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to say, like, when I was talking to the person that connected us, I was like, yeah, we we knew each other way, way, way back when. Um, But now I'm aging us. How is everything going? How's life? (laughs) Yeah, life is good. Um, Yeah. Uh, Busy here in San Diego. Um, Excited for the Pro Circuit events. And we've got pretty much an event every weekend here. So we're just going kind of back to back, but this is a special uh, tour that started and we're really lucky to be a part of it. Okay. Before we get all into that, I want you to kind of give us your bio, your background. I obviously know you're a very accomplished tennis player. Your name always came up in juniors. Your dad is an amazing coach and was very well respected all through, I mean, our junior career and forever. Um, So tell me kind of about how you started tennis, what tennis looked like as a junior player, and then how you progressed and how you got to where you are now. Yeah, it's it's good. Um, So it's all relative when people say I was really good. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) um, but uh, yeah, so I, like my siblings and my cousins, we were kind of born into the world of tennis. My dad is the oldest of nine Redondo kids that pretty much played tennis at a pretty high level. So uh, really, really fortunate to be, uh, to grow up in the game. Uh, My father was the head coach at San Diego State for about 12 years. So I grew up on the campus um, hitting, watching practice, traveling with the team. Um, and then, you know, was able to start my junior career, um, at a really young age. I think I played my first tournament when I was five, something like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I was really, really fortunate to, um, be around a lot of great coaches, a lot of great players to progress, um, with a lot of support from the USTA. I was able to travel the world, play a lot of international tournaments as a junior, Um, talking about wild tennis Academy, my sophomore and junior years, I got, I think my first ATP point when I was 15 or so. So it was a really good time for me. Um, and, uh, yeah. And then from there I played for Peter Smith at Pepperdine my freshman year and then went back to, you know, where I, where I came from and transferred to San Diego state and played for, uh, John Nelson and, and had a really, really great experience in college and college tennis. So yeah, that was that was uh, really nice for me to go back. I actually assisted Gene Carswell there too, who I think actually is a former New Mexico player, He's a Lobo. Lobo. Yes, because we were uh, Mountain West Conference. I played for New Mexico, yeah. so always those fun connections. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And then from there, keep going. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's long. And then from there, uh, three and a half years with Gene at San Diego State, and uh, went to Stockton to the University of the Pacific. Um, for nine and a half years. Maybe this is, I always love this question because it's one I get when I talk about transitioning from like coaching college to something else in tennis. What made you leave college coaching or did you just want to be back in San Diego? Is there any reason? What was the change that happened? Yeah, it's interesting. And, and you, you asked about, you know, how I got to where I'm at now. Yeah. And I got to where I'm at now because of mostly my time at University of the Pacific. So When I was there, you know, I don't know if I had ever gone to Stockton in my life, you know, before (laughs) I became the coach there. Um, So it was not known as a tennis hub, really, at least in my Mm -hmm. world. And so when I went up there, I was like, all right, you know, where am I going? And and when I, you know, when we rooted down and and uh, and moved there, um, you know, I saw that okay, we're going to have to do a lot of community building through tennis. And so I was able to do that, and you know, a lot of small things like teaching PE tennis in preschools, going to churches and teaching to the to three and four year olds. Uh, we lined blacktops, you know, through a, a grant through the USTA. Um, we did, you know, kids days whenever we could. And so I just started to do a lot of grassroots tennis and I really loved it. 
And so, yeah. you know, my, I remember my boss was like, Hey Ryan, you know, you're the head coach at the university of Pacific. Um, yeah. you don't do too much, but it was just something that I knew I needed to do to bring awareness to the team and to tennis. And it's something that I love doing. Mm-hmm. I said, I would, you know, I joined the ta- the homelessness task force, um, and just saw how we could really just connect the sport, um, through the city, bring, bringing tournaments, um, how that helps the economy. So I was just able to do a ton of things that, um, when this position opened up, um, I saw, wow, that is a really, really good fit for me. I was really excited mm-hmm. about it. And May 1st was two years and here we are. Wow. That's crazy. Dang, that's awesome. And I have to admit, I've been like creeping on the Barnes Tennis Center website and the facility looks more amazing than it's ever looked. If anyone listening has ever been there, you know, it's like a massive tennis center, but like it's growing and getting bigger and you guys are adding padel and pickleball and it's it looks amazing. So that's that's really cool. It seems like it's been a really good chemistry for you and the tennis center. Yeah, yeah, it's well, the first thing is we have an unbelievable staff here. So the team that we have, we work really well together, uh, very similar vision of where we want the, the organization to go. Um, and so the organization, U Tennis San Diego, is a nonprofit that owns and operates Barnes Tennis Center. So we were able to really come up with a, a model of how we're going to grow the organization using the Barnes Tennis Center as well. And so um, we've, a- we've been able to do a lot to the center so far. And um, we, we got a $2.5 million grant from the state wow. um, to do wow. renovations to the building and to the facility and stuff. So we have a lot coming up that is keeping me busy. Um, but it is looking really nice. And it's, uh, it's what it deserves to, it deserves the, the love and, and care. I love it. That's awesome. Well, that sounds like a good transition into this SoCal Pro Circuit. Tell me everything. How did it begin? Where, who, is, who helped form it? I'll keep asking you lots of questions. But let's start at the beginning. What is it? What is the SoCal Pro Circuit? Yeah, so the SoCal Pro Circuit, the transitional tour, it's a series of six tournaments here in Southern California. So the first three in San Diego, and then it goes up to LA and Orange County. Uh, they're fifteen thousand dollar tournaments on the ITF circuit, Pro Circuit for men and women, um, and uh, it, it's really it was created to give our up and coming aspiring professional players, Keegan Smith, right. Um, our top mm-hmm. collegiate players, give them the platform and our top junior high level juniors, the opportunity to stay here in Southern California, stay home and get the, ex- the opportunity and experience to play a ton of tournaments, get the ranking points that are needed to continue to climb the ranks and play the challengers and, and um, ATP WTA tour and, um, and provide that right here. I mean, it's, it's Southern California, as you know, mm-hmm. and, and as everybody knows, the weather is amazing. Um, mm-hmm. It's been a hotbed, you know, of, pro tennis, of junior tennis, college tennis, uh, forever. And so um, really spearheaded by Chris Boyer and many others, but Chris was really the driving force behind getting this and with the support of the SETA and Trevor Croneman and a lot of just locals that said, yeah, we want to, we, we need to get SoCal tennis back on the radar, back on the calendar. And so that's how it was started and with a lot of teamwork and, and um, you know, Kathy Jacobson's been great at connecting everybody and getting this going. That's awesome. Um, and how are players signing up for this? Are they already going to be very experienced? Have they already played in ITF? Are they going to be junior players? Or is it going to be a mix of everything? Tell me who's playing these tournaments or who should be who should we be watching in these tournaments? Yeah, so the $15,000 is is the, the starting level of pro circuit uh, events. And so I, I do think we're going to have a good, healthy mix of high-level players, junior college, and then um, I expect to have some probably really good pros coming in too that could be ranked pretty high. Um, and I say that because it's you've got six tournaments in Southern California, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, just in San mm-hmm. Diego alone, you know, it's a small, big city, but essentially there's three weeks in a row they can stay in the same hotel or the same housing and play three weeks. And so I think we're going to have a really good mix of players. Um, I think it's going to be strong because of the six in a row. Um, but, you know, San Diego, LA, Orange County, we have some really, really high level juniors. Uh, just in, you know, looking at the uh, ITF grade one that we just hosted here, Lerner Tan winning that from, you know, up from Orange County, Katie Codd from San Diego getting to the semis. So for the junior level, I'm really excited. And then I can't even name all the players on the college level from Southern California that 
are going to probably do really well. So, yeah, but there's a, I think everybody should come out to really watch these players. And is it going to be broadcast on the internet or even on Tennis Channel or anywhere that someone, maybe if they're not in California, they can tune in and check it out? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So it'll, it oh, will awesome. be streamed. Um, I can speak specifically for us and USD, who's right before us. We're using Track Tennis. That's what we have online. And uh, our friends at Cracked Rackets will be, Alex will be commentating as well. Nice. Um, I know on Tuesdays is media day. So there's going to be a lot of media and probably social media streams that are going to be going out and giving updates. But yes, all the matches will be live streamed. Um, and that was something that was really important to the tour and, and to Chris is to make sure that these matches are also visible. And do you guys worry ever about someone like high level, I mean, higher level than they maybe normally wouldn't be playing a 15K, but it's close to home. They might pop in. I know there's a lot of players in California that call California their home base and it might be, we kind of saw it like when COVID was transitioning and players were coming back to the ITF, there was like, I think it was like An Amanda Anasmova who signed up for a 60K yeah. or something. And it was like, oh, dang it. She's not necessarily taking the spot from someone else that would be there based on their level and spot position. But do you see that happening or do you think it will it will play out correctly? I think it'll play out correctly. It's, it's natural yeah. because it, on the other side of the coin to that, the experience that the players will have to play that individual Two examples come to mind. We had the ITA Masters here in 20, 2020. Mm -hmm. Raymond Sarmiento signed up, and he's been ranked very high in the tour. Top college player from SC. And Kyle Kang, who's a junior, beat him. Right? Wow. So you look up, oh, man, he's in it. It's gonna be, he's going to take over. But that experience that Kyle got, even if he lost, would have been amazing for him. Right? When I ran the Challengers up in Stockton, we gave, I think, uh, Jensen Brooksby his first wild card into a $100,000 Challenger in Qualies. Wow. I think he got to the last round qualities, you know, <laughs> some good players as like a 15 year old. So um, the experience is, regardless of the result is really, really um, valuable for the, for the players. If a number one seed like that comes in. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And this is like the favorite question of every fan of American tennis is what is the state of affairs with American tennis? How's it going for the SoCal juniors? I mean, I feel like we've always had such a strong section and I'm seeing all of these players transition successfully into college and then successfully on to the pro tour, which is amazing. So talk to me a little bit about the up and coming generation. Going back to our ITF grade one, we had three of the four semifinalists from Southern California. Wow. You know, and I think that's a really good example of where Southern California juniors are, American juniors. You know, our number one seed was 20 in the world. Our number one seed on the girls' side was eight in the world from the United States. You know, I think we're in a really healthy spot. And I think it's because of the awareness and the growth um, that people want to see out of, out of our players. Um, and when you look at this tour that was created, it's created to help and give that platform. So I think that, um, you know, the state is, is the future is bright. If you look at the tour right now, with what we're doing. I mean, Taylor is, is really doing well on the women's side. We have a lot of great players that are going far um, and in their household names now. And mm -hmm. I think that's really important, the awareness, right? So giving, giving the, the opportunities to our players here at home and the awareness. And then you talked about the college players that are now transitioning at a higher level. I think it's, you have some great coaches that are developing players and, and now the players are seeing, okay, this is a platform. And so I've been able to see that firsthand as a coach. And um, and just knowing, you know, the collegiate world, there's some coaches that really can, uh, well, let's just say they're some of the best coaches in the world that can develop these kids. Yeah. I was, I, yeah, I love what you just said. I was going to lean on that and ask, do you feel like the trend has changed in the past, let's say, 20 years? Since we were juniors going to, into college, it was kind of like, are you good enough to go pro? Okay, go pro or go play college. And it was a harder transition back then. Um, do you feel like it's gotten easier because, you know, maybe a couple of people led the way and showed some of the up and comers like, hey, you had a good college career. Like, don't you can keep going. Let's go. And they're kind of like creating these small little teams. But would you say the culture's changed a bit from college transitioning into the pros now? That's a good question. I don't know because let's just like if you go back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, you had all these great college players that then transitioned, right? USC right. is just 
it, it, you know, they're known for all of these years of having the all American Stanford. Right. Right. Um, so I don't know. I think it just comes in the kind of peaks and valleys. And so yeah. when you're in that valley and that might've been more difficult for our years because the opportunities to go out and play or, or, you know, where were the tournaments at might've just been at that lower point. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that college tennis has always had a healthy stream of players that have developed, um, and maybe developed and got to that next level, like the, like what we're seeing now. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe that was in the valleys of our time, but, um, you know, I just, I think college tennis is, has been a huge platform. And when it's, when we are in that valley, you know, that's when people start to talk about, oh, it's not working and stuff. Right. Um, yeah. Too much. And so, you know, I think it's just a trend, but no, college, college tennis is, you know, to me, it's the platform to really develop unless you're an Alcaraz or something, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Which those are far and few between. Yeah. yeah. And we have a couple sponsored team t ladies that I just always love to like gush about them because there's this whole little crew that like played college tennis and now they're playing doubles. They're top 25, top 30 doubles players. And it's just really cool to see how they learn so much in college and developed as a person and yeah. obviously as a tennis player. But now they're like continuing to like take that with them. And it it feels less individual. And of course, they're playing doubles, but it feels less individual. And they're like they've got their team on tour now, which I think is so cool. Yeah. Here, I'll give you another great example or a great yeah. story. So up in, in Stockton, we held, I believe we held an ITA summer circuit and the winner would get a qualifying wild card into the $60,000 challenger we held a few months later. Uh, I'm going to say her last name wrong. She'll kill me, but Desiree Krawcheck. Oh, I know yep. Des. Yep. <laughs> we came to play it, right? Coming from Arizona State. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The, you know, little UOP playing an ITA summer circuit, but we had some great players. We That's had some awesome. great players play that because we gave them the opportunity for that next step. She came out, she won it, got the wild card, played doubles, got through some rounds, and now look where she's at. Right. Not that we gave that to her, but she took the opportunity. And that's what we're we're starting to see is these the opportunities are there for them to to take. And and I always, you know, we or not just me, but we have to look at Italy, what they've done. You know, they they've just implemented so many opportunities and look where they're going. Yeah. yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, talk to me a little bit about playing doubles. How are the juniors? It, I assume there's going to be doubles also at this series of tournaments. Yep. Yep. And how do you see? Um, there's a lot of people kind of trying to start watch more doubles. Um, all that we all know that most tennis players who play tennis uh, for fun on the recreation level are usually playing doubles, and we love watching doubles. But it's a little bit harder to kind of lean into that side of things. So how is How's it going with the juniors and the up and coming players with the doubles? And are you seeing anything kind of change out there or talk to me about doubles? <laughs> yeah. Doubles. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if we're talking about like juniors, you know, I think we are putting a, a higher emphasis in developing doubles practices and, and players because of college tennis. Mm-hmm. Um, we have some really young kids in our junior academy here at Barnes. We emphasize a lot of doubles technique on volleys, and um, and so I think that the trend of developing doubles players is coming back, and realizing that the skills that you learn there, serve and volley, uh, the continental grip, the eastern grip, is really important for your singles, right? Yes. And so I think we're going back to that, and a big a, a, a huge component of that is to be successful to get re- successfully recruited in college tennis, right? Specifically here in Southern California, I think mm-hmm. Southern Californians love doubles. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think our our pro circuit events are going to have some strong players playing it, some really fun, exciting matches. Um, when we ran the, the San Diego Open ATP event here in October, mm-hmm. um, we were packing the stands for the doubles matches. And the doubles players were coming off saying, just enjoy because they get to play in front of people that typically they don't get to play in front of. So Southern California is really, really uh, supportive of doubles. And, um, and even when you look at our adult leagues and adult tournaments that we have here in Southern California, San Diego, that's, that's what you're doing because it is social. It is, um, it's fun. So I, I hope to see it continue to grow. 
Awesome. Yeah, it's definitely got a cult following, but everyone plays doubles and everyone loves doubles. So it's really cool to hear how the fans really just enjoy watching as well. So that's that's awesome. Um, you've named some players, but who else should our listeners be on the lookout for, especially in this series of tournaments? Uh, well, if you look at uh, the Rancho Santa Fe uh, tournament, Meg McC- uh, McCray won, mm-hmm. for, played for Oklahoma State local. Um, she won the wild card tournament for Rancho Santa Fe. So I think she could do really well. Um, gosh, you know, looking at a Keegan Smith, like I said, you know, doing really well in challengers. I see him coming back. Um, I'd love to see some of our higher level juniors, Lerner Tien, um, Katie Cod. There's actually too many to name from Southern California. <laughs> that have really good opportunities. Um, you know, just here, if we can get like an August Holmgren, right from USD coming down and playing, and Solomar from num- uh, number one at San Diego at uh, USD and San Diego State's number one girl has, I think she's been you know top five hundred in the WTA. So wow. we have some really good local players. Um, it's going to be kind of a who's playing these events, you know who's who here. So really exciting. That's really cool. And I assume you guys have all your social channels will be buzzing with information and on site behind the scenes, all of that too. Yeah, yeah, and the, and. Uh, Pro Circuit has their own Instagram and Facebook as well, so people should plug in there. Um, for our tournament here, just go on our website, and you can that's where you can find the online streaming. Um, obviously, over at Cracked Rackets as well. Um, but yeah, there's going to be plenty of opportunities to stay stay connected with the events. Nice. Well, I have another kind of random question for you, but it always kind of comes to my head with this new generation. They have social game, they have the TikTok, they have the Instagram stories and all that. Are you seeing that play into some of these up and coming players? Do they have pretty like solid followings even going into a tournament? And can people keep up with them? Is it are you seeing any kind of like trends? And is it hard for them to manage that side of life as well as being this high level tennis player? Um, it's funny. I was having that conversation with some friends last night about like TikTok, which I haven't gone <laughs> on. I've seen it on Instagram, right? I, I, I'm on Instagram, but um, yeah. no, I don't think it's hard for them to manage because there's, it's kind of, it's, it's part of the culture. Yeah. So they're just doing it. It is for these up and coming players. Um, I think it's a great platform for them to share their stories and their messages mm-hmm. as long as it's positive. Um, you know, I think it's great for the younger players to see them. Um, and to, to replicate maybe some of the practices they have or values, you know, and work ethics. And then when you look at NIL with the, the whole NCAA stuff, mm-hmm. it's a platform for them to, you know, promote themselves and partner with companies and give them that extra opportunity to, to create some, some funding to go and play, you know, and maybe that was a kind of going back to our conversation, maybe that was the harder part when we played in college, where are we going to get that fun? If you didn't have the family background uh, specifically for me that could go out and just fund you, where are we going to get the money to play? And so I had to go to Germany and, you know, play league and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think the social media side is a really great opportunity for them to take that and run with it. You know, I, I think there's a lot of negativity with social media and we talk about how it could be hurting them, but it's, it's where we are now. This is how business is done. This is, how communication is going. This is leaders in the world are communicating on social media. So as you know, I think we need to really have the confines and the boundaries of keeping it positive and healthy Mm -hmm. for them so that we we can protect their mental health. We can protect their social lives, um, but use it and, and run with it. Yeah, I like that perspective. That's a really good point. And I think I am on TikTok, which, but I use it, or most people use it to lean into what they're excited about. So, you know, it, it's it's a cool way to learn also. And as you say, tell a story. So I like yeah, that I, answer. My, fr- my a friend of mine last night, he said, if you're seeing TikTok reels on Instagram, you're like three weeks. Yeah. Behind. I couldn't even cut. I was like, wow, we're getting, you know. <laughs> philosophical right now where I am in time, (laughs) but I guess I need to get up to speed. Well, and for the record, we were in college when Facebook launched, so (laughs) (laughs) it's changed quite a bit. And then even as a coach, I'm sure, I'm sure you, I, I just remember like, Facebook was a thing, but it was like the players posting pictures that were not on the tennis court. Like that was, it's changed so much. (laughs) Yeah, it has. And so, and then 
really looking as a college coach when we had to start really being trained about social media and stuff. And you, when you look at your memories and you're like, wow, I posted that, you know, compared <laughs> to now what you're posting. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty funny. Yeah. It's cool to see the evolution. Um, okay. No more social media. Um, how is, this is a polarizing topic. How are the other racket sports doing at Barnes Tennis Center? Like I said, I was looking at your guys' website and the paddle section or paddle. I don't know how you, you can tell me how we should properly say it. Um, how's that and pickleball for you? Yeah. Um, and I don't think there's one right way to say it. It depends on which country <laughs> you're from. Um, I played the senior world championships, uh, in March yes. and the president of, of the board during the opening ceremonies was going back and forth. So okay. I just realized, okay, I can say whatever I want. Yeah. But, um, I think there's, they're trying to distinguish between paddle tennis mm-hmm. and paddle, right? And yes. it's, the, it's the Spanish way of saying it because it's not paddle tennis. It's, it's two different sports. So okay. we need to come up with, with that here in the United States, but, um, they will. Yeah, for for us, the the other racket sports are doing great. You know, we we're a sixteen acre facility, and where we put them um, when I was hired was pretty much dead space. You know, it wasn't used, and um, and so we were able to to look at the space and say, okay, how are we going to use this? How are we going to build new community here? Um, ultimately, everything is to bring awareness to what our organization is about, which is supporting youth tennis and creating you know, the educational, social, um, positive benefits of sport into the, into kids' lives. Mm -hmm. And so when, when we put that in, there's a a strong purpose. Well, adults are going to come out and play Adele and, and, uh, pickleball. Right. And so what we're seeing is, you know, that they, they come out and play while their kid is in a junior program, or they just get to understand what our mission is. So it was really purposeful for us Mm -hmm. to put them in. Um, they were in spots that didn't affect tennis, um, so that was also positive. I'm not going to mm-hmm. ever, ever put pickleball lines on a tennis court here. I'm not a, uh, a supporter of that. I'm, I, but I am, as you can see, a supporter of other sports. I think it's, you know, it's really uh, positive for community building and, and for us, you know, in particular, we had the space to do it. So it's, it was great. Nice. That's a good answer. And everyone listening out there is like, yes, don't put the pickleball next to the tennis. Let's separate those. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. I mean, we, like I said, we really, really support pickleball. And I think they need their own facilities. They need their own courts throughout the United States. Yeah. And I think, you know, the natural progression was, well, let's put it on a court at a club and the club saw the, the financial revenue of that, which is good. But as it expands and you're starting to see some really high level players play it in these massive tournaments, you know, they deserve their own facilities. Um, and tennis deserves its own facilities, but Dell does as well and, and everything else. Good answer. And they're super fun. I mean, they're fun sports to play, right? Yeah. And it's it's a pretty relatively easy learning curve if you're coming from tennis to the other two. Padel's a bit harder, in my opinion. But yeah, I think Padel might be a little bit more you know, so Padel, because it's smaller and you have the paddle, the you know, the entry to rallying is there. Yeah. But I'm taking lessons <laughs> so that I can learn, you know, okay, the ball's gonna hit the glass here. Yeah. Oh. And I need to do a turn. You know, there's so many more nuances to Padel than tennis. I think pickleball is the more simple um sport to come in and learn. But um yeah, they're really, really fun. Nice. Okay, to wrap this one up, what are you currently excited about in the world of tennis from whatever level it can be, the junior level, the pro level, it can be all of the above. What's exciting you about tennis right now? Wow, that's a that's a tough question. It's a loaded question. Uh, in, in I know. Our place right now, we have so many things going on, but um, you know, I think what we saw with COVID is that there's a huge growth. And so to me, that's exciting because now we're kind of, you know, we're all aware of our, how we're going to continue that growth and how we're going to continue to build tennis and grow tennis. So that's really exciting to me. And, and I'm, I'm really lucky to be a part of groups that are looking at different ways to do that. We have tons of tournaments here. Personally, if I can give our organization a little plug. Yeah, please. Um, we created a, an initiative called JUMP, which is Junior Tournaments Underwriting Master Plan. So for all USTA level seven and junior circuit events, we are, we're doing them for free. So we've taken away all entry fees, which is, you know, for us is really, uh, you know, the, what is giving them the opportunity to play these tournaments without 
the financial burden. But what they get from that is is the really, really exciting thing. So mm-hmm. I'm really excited to see the growth of sport at this younger age, not just competitively, but socially. You know, they, we, we run one a month. So now the kids are starting to create friends. You know, the parents are starting to know each other. So I'm really, really excited about seeing junior tennis at the foundational level grow. We have some really exciting news coming out soon about stuff we're bringing to Barnes on the higher levels. Um, But really that foundational level to me is the most exciting thing. That's cool. And while I have you, since you've kind of been on all sides of tennis, what's kind of your best advice for maybe a parent listening who has a kid that they see potential in? The the biggest question I always see is like, they're so scared of burnout and what does burnout look like? How, I guess, what's the best advice for a parent just parenting a good junior player at this moment in time? And how do they make sure that it continues to be fun, they continue to improve, and everything keeps going in the right direction? Yeah, that's a great question and really, really important. Yes. <laughs> most important, right? And I don't have, trust me, I don't have the right answer for that. Uh, I think maybe I have some direction where I could suggest, but to me it's education. And I say that because most of the, most parents were not players, right. Mm -hmm. Or have the experience of what it feels like to be on the court competitively. And there's a lot of feelings. And so when we talk about burnout, you know, a lot of times people are just talking about the physical burnout, which then affects the mental burnout. But then Mm -hmm. if you go a little deeper, there's the emotional burnout, right? And the mm-hmm. emotional body and the emotional side to that then affects other things, mm-hmm. right? Relationships, how you view things, how you view the world, how you view communication. And so it's very nuanced in that level. And we don't want to be uneducated when our kids are nine years old, 10 years old, 11 at that early stage. On the other side of that, a lot of times I see parents that are really hands off and just go have fun until mm-hmm. they really kind of like, 13, 14, now they they did really well in a tournament, and now they're, oh, now we're getting somewhere. And it's the we are getting somewhere. And and that's important because they are the ones investing in in their kids, and they're with them all the time, but the kid is the one playing. So I just go back to the word of education. Yeah. And as your child grows, continue to, as they get to one level and have to get to the next level, so do you and your your, um, support system for them. And so there's a lot of resources out there um, of coaches, of groups, of organizations that coach parents of how to become a better uh, sport parent. So Mm -hmm. I highly recommend that. Uh, Highly recommend it. No, that's great. And if you kind of think of our sport from the top down, the most successful players at the pro level have a team and, you know, they're traveling with people that help them stay you know, knowledgeable and everything. So it's almost like building a team. And I loved what you said earlier about how a child can go play a clinic or a lesson and the parents will be on site also, whether they're maybe playing pickleball or they're watching or they're connecting or they're getting, you know, ready to sign up their their kids for a tournament. So being able to find people that will help they can bring into their team because it you need you need resources and you can't do it alone. So I love that. That's awesome. Yeah, that is, that's cool. And when you're saying that, I'm thinking, you made me think of like a parenting support system, you know, yes. role, right? Because a lot of times if you're, I'll, I'll just use Barnes here. What I love that I see sometimes with our parents, we have a track around the facility. While the clinic is going on, I'll see a bunch of parents walking or jogging the track together. And I think that's so cool, right? Yeah. Because the kids can go do their thing. They're trusting the coach to go ahead and you do the coaching right now. Now they're socializing in a healthy way. Mm-hmm. Right? They could be talking about their kids and tennis. Who knows what they're talking about? But that is that is really cool to me to think about how that could be a positive direction for uh, maybe clubs and coaches to create for parents. So maybe it goes both ways where the centers and coaches need to create stuff for the parents too. So 100%. maybe we're on to something. Yes, <laughs> I like it. I know. We need that human connection. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, last question. Are you still competing, and what's your current gear of choice? Uh, current gear of choice, uh, Technifiber and Lacoste. Ah, nice. <laughs> yeah, love them. Uh, we have a we have a really nice partnership, and they're here at the Barnes Tennis Center. We just created a new pro shop um, that you can get all their 
all their gear here at Barnes. Um, awesome. So love, love them. The Lacoste yes. shoes to me are the best shoes out there. Wow. Yeah. I mean, if they're good enough for Daniel Medvedev, I think the rest of us can. They, they fly <laughs> off our shelves. I'm not joking. People love them. Um, and Technofiber, you know, the, the rackets are great. Um, mm-hmm. The screen has always been really good. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so I, I really, really love them. Um, and compete, Fidel. Nice, yeah. yeah so <laughs> we we run some tournaments here. I was, you know, really, really fortunate to play in the Senior World Championships for the U.S. Um, so getting into that, it's like a it's like a second life of competition. That's awesome. I know uh, Quinn Borchard yeah. Borchard just played Ojai, and I was like, "You're keeping it alive for us." But yeah, the guys a- that are still doing it and, and ladies still doing it in tennis, it's so crazy. much respect. Well, <laughs> did you see Cecil Mamet like? destroyed the draw and i'm yeah. like he was in college when we were in junior so. yeah yeah i know so much respect for those guys that still have it you know and and have the physical health to continue to do it i think i'd have another knee surgery oh yeah okay well plug everything that you need to plug for barnes tennis your social if you want and then the us these usta socal pro circuit tournaments how can people follow we'll make sure we add links so everyone can just click and it will be easy but plug all the things oh man um yeah well barnes tennis center.com you'll find it and, and both on facebook and instagram my facebook is really about what we're doing here um, you can find me on Facebook at Ryan Redondo and then Instagram about, you know, my tennis world and racket world is uh, Ryan Redondo underscore tennis. Um, so you can get all of that information. And then um, I don't want to incorrectly state pro circuits, uh, social media handles, but I do know that they have them there. Um, and then obviously ICTA.com too. Yeah. Awesome. And then last, last, I promise last question. How's Skip? He's doing well. Yeah. yeah, he's in northern. He's still in Northern California. He's the director of tennis at Oakland Hills Racquet Club, um, and uh, grinding on the tennis court. I was going to ask. That's awesome. I love it. I think I feel like I'll always just know him as what he was in like 1999, which yeah. is like tan <laughs> tennis. Like, yeah. Changed. I love it. Awesome. Well, thank you, Ryan, so much for joining me. And we appreciate your time and telling us all about the new tournaments coming and the new players coming up and super exciting stuff. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it.